Electricast. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to The Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, I'm the founder, and my mission is to help ethical entrepreneurs and holistic healers to find their voice through spiritual coaching and podcasting. I'm honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through healing, kindness, innovation, purpose, and spirit. Understanding that to create collective change, we need to be the change. It all begins with us. Joseph Malone is the CEO and founder of Southern Cross Safety Academy, a personal safety training company that provides life-saving mindset and skills training to private citizens and corporations. A former Marine Special Operations Command, Joe was deployed numerous times across the globe, working on some of the most insane and highly classified operations, and ultimately ended up being diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury from all the blast exposure and PTSD. Since leaving the military, Joe has provided customised training programs to private citizens and corporations around the world on mental resilience and self-reliant personal safety skills. He is the published author of The Women's Safety Guide and aims to train over 1 million citizens in personal safety and awareness. I hope you get some awareness and tips from this episode that may help you if you find yourself in potential danger. Welcome, Joe, to The Ethical Evolution. Hey, thank you very much, Bindi. Now, I'm so glad uh, you're with us today. You're also joining us uh, from Chicago, uh, Illinois. Um, So thank you for making the time for us today. For those people who don't know who you are and what you do, can you go ahead and tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Joe Malone. I'm a former special operations Marine, and I now spend my time teaching people how to be safe against violence and violent crime. And um, you have had an interesting story yourself. So if we we back up the truck a little, Joe, and we start with your story, um, getting into the Marines and, and subsequently on the other side of that, can you can you take us through your story and what happened for you? Yeah, absolutely. I I grew up just outside of Chicago, a really culturally diverse area. And at a very early age, I got involved with just a really kind of gross older group of people, a lot of drugs, hard drugs. And so I was putting things in my body, putting things in my veins, uh, just at a very early age. It's I kind of look at 16 year olds these days. And I think that that's what I was doing, uh, you know, shooting up dope and I'm drinking incessantly and crashing cars and stuff. And, you know, so I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, I never ended up in prison like a lot of my other friends did. But my best friend joined the Marines back in 2005. I saw his boot camp graduation one year later. I, I shipped off to boot camp myself because I saw the transformation it made in him. And I didn't want him to go off to war by himself. I did uh, 13 years total. I ended up becoming a part of the newly formed Marine Special Operations Command. It had never been around since World War II. They disbanded the Marine Special Operations units. And you either had to join the SEALs or the Green Berets or something like that. But they restood it back up. I tried out. I got selected, deployed a few more times. And in total, I did 13 years, seven deployments, all the major combative theaters, Uh, I'm not going to say that I had the most kinetic deployments. I didn't, you know, do all of the most crazy story work that you hear out there. But the guys that I worked with who mentored me, those were the ones who were the super heavy hitters. And I was able to do a lot of really amazing things overseas in terms of, you know, operations. I just, uh, I just wish that it would have been more long-term sustaining and positive and positively impactful. I don't think that it was. Uh, it's kind of maybe a story from another time, or if you want to dive further, we can here in a moment. But ultimately, I, I came to a crossroads. I was horribly depressed. Uh, I wanted to end my life. I was drinking a lot. I was acting erratically because of all the blast exposures. I was diagnosed with like a traumatic brain injury, worked my way through it, got out of the military and said, what am I going to do? And 
at that time, active shooters were really ramping up here in the States. And in the special operations community, we live in an active shooter environment consistently overseas. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe I could help out people with that problem here in the States. Turns out a lot of schools, corporations, and police stations don't want help on it, which is a theory as to why I, I think we see so much of it still perpetuating. And so I realized that the ordinary everyday citizen does want help in learning how to defend themselves. And that's kind of how uh, that became about. Mm, and <clears throat> so much to unpack there, Joe. Um, obviously, on the other side of uh, your career in the Marines, uh, that, that, that had a long term effect on you. Do, do you still feel its impacts today? From the military? Mm. Yes and no. I've really been fortunate enough to learn how to elevate myself and uh, change my neurology and to understand energy to the point where it's not like it did in any regard. Like I could never go back to that negative vibrational tone that I was at. However, you know, there's there's times where, you know, like a Memorial Day just passed up uh, on, on July 10th. We had a a crash that occurred and it killed six guys that I worked with. And, you know, that sometimes still will bring up some mm. uh, feelings, but it's not like it was by any means, but yeah, that stuff will always live with me. And sometimes I don't even believe a lot of it happened quite honestly. Like mm. I mean, some of the stuff that takes place in those environments is, is pretty wild. Mm. You would have seen some incredible things uh, during your time, no doubt. Now, um, let's let's get to it. Let's get to this gun violence. You know, like I I visited the US last year and before I went, people said to me, aren't, aren't you afraid? Aren't you scared? Because, like, you know, everybody's carrying a gun over there. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm fine. Um, and to be fair, I was in a very well-to-do suburb in LA, so I was fine. But <laughs> in some places in America, it's not fine. Um, and there are people who are carrying guns and think it's their right to do that. Um, as you probably know here in Australia, uh, we have laws around that and you have to have a licence to carry a gun and it, you have to have it, you know, stored correctly and, and all of these sort of things. But in America it's very, very different. What do you think, why do you think it is the government agencies, police, authorities don't want to change this and don't want help? Um, you mean like in terms of uh, the ability for somebody to carry a gun in the States? More so like why, why do you think it's not changing? Well, it's, um, it's, it's definitely cultural. Mm. So when you look back at the way that Australia was formed, how, how was Australia formed? back the very first people, not the Aborigines, but when they first started putting people on that continent, what was the purpose behind that? Well, I mean, yeah, they, the English came here just like, you know, other explorers came to the US and and colonised. So, Right. Yeah. But Australia specifically was a place where they would also send people like prisoners that Correct. they didn't want in England and Britain and things like that. So that's how Australia was originally being formed in terms of like that colonial uh, mm. era. In the United States, what a lot of people don't understand is the United States is the single greatest example of an insurgency ever in the history of the world. We have proven through the de defeating the colonial British at that time that there's never been a guerrilla warfare campaign more successful, a group of insurgents more successful, ever in the history of what we can tell in recorded hit in recorded history. And a part of that has to do with, of course, the right to bear arms in order to fight off an oppressive government force. Now, Australia is a little unique because you guys are pretty isolated. You're your own continent out there in the ocean, and you're not tied to other land masses directly. Sure, you got, you know, New Zealand, and then you got the chain of the Malaysian islands that are nearby and Timor. But with the United States specifically, we're quite technically landlocked to the rest of the world. You know, you've got Canada, you've got Mexico, South America, but then that also bridges across over into Russia, et cetera. So to kind of just tie this all back, the reason why we're probably never going to see any sort of ban on carrying weapons here in the United States 
is because it's deeply seated within the cultural roots. And, and what I mean by that specifically is that we were forged by empowering the everyday ordinary person, the weak, the, the sickly, we were forged by empowering them with the ability to defend themselves against the most volatile tyrant force that was known in existence at that time, and that being the British colonial empire for those people. And because it has such a deep-seated and integral root within the fabric of American society, you know, we'll never, at least I don't think we will ever, but, you know, time will tell. I don't think we'll ever see a, a change to that in terms of the right to bear arms in the States. Mm. And, you know, looking at your background, Joe, you've, you've got a lot of qualifications and a lot of skills that are, that are quite unique to have all in one package. Um, can you go through some of those for us and, and, and how you know so much about firearms? Yeah, so I wasn't raised around guns. Um, my mom was raised in the country on a cattle farm. So her side of the family is very, you know, knowledgeable in the country and hunting and firearms. They, they've always grown up with a lot of guns. My dad's side of the family in Chicago, where I grew up was not. In fact, the first time I touched a gun, I was nine. I didn't touch another one until I was maybe 12. And then it really wasn't until the military when I was introduced to firearms on a regular basis. So being in the military, the Marine Corps, especially special operations command, going overseas into combative environments, a lot of people mistake what the special operations mission set predominantly is and what it has been for the last decade in the global war on terrorism story for another time in my own opinion is that we go into areas like for example iraq when isis was running through literally killing massacring thousands of people in these villages helpless people kidnapping their children raping their children selling them off into sex slavery abusing them you know the, the worst things you could ever imagine human beings doing to another person well we get sent into those environments to link up with the families who have been suffering the consequences of those people's actions the people who have been victimized by those evil people and what we do is we empower them. And how do we empower them? By giving them firearms and training and teaching them and showing them how they can possibly fight back. We're teaching the kid how to punch a bully back in the face, essentially. And then we go to the playground and we punch the bullies back alongside them. So that's really where the firearms piece comes in. I've worked on an ambulance for a little bit. I'm a nationally registered EMT, but I've also been through a lot of advanced medical courses through my time in the special operations community, the Marine Corps has a major shortage of medics because we use Navy corpsmen. And the Navy corpsmen, special amphibious reconnaissance corpsmen, that's the medics that get attached to us, they have like a two-year training pipeline. And so they're very far behind in terms of like the deployment rotations. So because of my experience on the ambulance, I was able to kind of fill in with some of those positions. And then really my global, just worldly traveling heart and spirit, you know, I've been to like 40 countries, I think at this point, something like that. And a lot of it was just of my own volition, traveling, integrating, assimilating with other cultures, literally just dropping myself off in some nations. And I can't believe I even survived those situations. Those were crazier probably than half my <laughs> military story. But, um, you know, on top of all that, I get myself very educated. So I have some pieces of paper to show people um, in terms of homeland security, emergency management, crisis systems management, and, and things like that. Because I want people to at least know that I could be validated by something outside of my own stories. Mm, that's incredible. And so now you actually train people to be safe or to stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's been the most rewarding thing in my entire life. And, and I do want to say that that doesn't necessarily just relate to firearms training. I will say that knowing how to use a firearm in any capacity, whether it's against another human, against an animal, or to get food if, you know, society collapses, like we see 2020, you know, on steroids, perhaps, mm. like it gets even worse, you know, people really need to know how to do these things. And so to know how to use a firearm, it's the single greatest tool tool that anybody could ever know how to use we're not trying to ever level the playing field against a violent criminal we're trying to overpower that violent criminal mm. because i don't know if you've ever been victimized before if you know somebody who have been victimized by a violent criminal before but it, it changes their life mm. it takes all of their cherished memories and it absolutely taints them and they're never going to be the same again unless they proactively take very calculated steps to get themselves back to that position where they feel a sense of self-confidence and purpose which 
Ironically enough, I've worked with some women specifically who were victimized pretty horribly and knowing how to use a firearm afterwards is what got them back to that level of self-love and self-confidence and self-belief in themselves because they knew that they had the ability, the skills, the knowledge, the power to overcome somebody if they ever tried to attack them again. And uh, But a lot of a lot of the training also is awareness, de-escalation. I'm an anti-violence advocate who teaches people how to employ violence when necessary. Mm, and that's that's such a great approach. And uh, no doubt there'd be a lot of mindset uh, training involved in that, Joe, because, you know, someone who, you know, may experience any kind of violence or, or abuse uh, is, as you say, impacted for life. And to then have that confidence to fight back, uh, that takes a lot of guts. It, it does. And you're absolutely right. It is a lot of mindset. So, Every person that I coach, I run like a coaching program for people who want more long-term sustainment training. And what we do is we first work on your mindset and your self-belief, the way that you talk to yourself. Then we work on your body, which means like your nutrition and your physical fitness, because there is a degree of physical fitness required in Mm. order for a human being to live a happy, full existent um, life, a present life. But also by nutrition, we don't just mean food and like oxidative materials that produce cancer and sicknesses. But we're also talking about the information that we're feeding ourselves, because if we listen to nothing but negative information all day, it affects the way we talk to ourselves. So if it affects the way we talk to ourselves, then that's going to affect our internal belief system. And if we have a negative internal belief system, which all humans default belief system is negative. It's Mm. a survival mechanism built in the brain so that we can see and spot negative circumstances because negativity is usually associated with death. And that's the brain's number one priority, keep us safe from death. So if we have a negative self-belief system, self-talk system, then we're not going to have the confidence to do anything really well. And so it starts with the mind and the spirit, and then it comes into the nutrition and the body. And then ultimately we work on the skill set. So once we can master, or I I use master lightly because we're always seeking that self-improvement, but Mm. once we can get ourselves on that right trajectory, then we can start to work on the skill sets. And then when we work on the skill sets, you know what the most beautiful thing about all this is? Most people are really good people. Mm. They really are. They're just misunderstood, miscommunicating in some way, form or fashion. And when we believe in ourselves as human beings, we're much more open to understanding one another. And when we are more understanding of one another, life is more peaceful and you have less violence. Mm. So with the training that you do, um, I know for a lot of women, sometimes, you know, we have busy lives, a lot of, lot of women are mothers, uh, they have multiple children, uh, and that takes their attention away from what they're doing. And often during that time is when they lose their situational awareness. Mm-hmm. How do you help people to keep that consistent mindset of being aware of their surroundings and where they are? That's such an awesome question. So, and, and this isn't necessarily a plug for it, but you can see over my shoulder here, I actually wrote a women's safety guide. Uh, not that I'm an expert on women, just so everybody knows, mm. not at all, <laughs> but I am an expert on safety and security. And I wrote that because I was teaching a corporate de-escalation class. It was all women. And in the class, where it's very interactive. All my training is interactive. And in the process of it all, I realized every single woman had been assaulted at one point in their life. And then I started to reach out to other women and ask them. I come from a family, predominantly women. I have no male cousins on my dad's side. It's all female. And my brother and I are the only men. And so I I wrote that book to help women develop the subconscious ability to become aware and have responsive skill sets. And so what I mean by that is, have you ever heard the saying that if you repeat something 10,000 times, it becomes a habit? Mm -hmm. So the reason behind that is the brain per gram of body weight burns more calories than any other organ in the body. The brain has two priorities, conserve energy because it doesn't know when it's going to eat next. We know as conscious human beings, but the subconscious primitive part of the brain doesn't. And then twos keep us safe from harm and death. Well, when we consciously think about things, again, we're burning more calories per gram of weight than any other organ. When we 
do something repetitively over and over and over again, the brain says, you know what, I'm done thinking about this. Let's put this in the subconscious, which is a hardened neural network, meaning that information travels over it without you having to consciously think about it. And it burns way less calories. It's kind of like when you're driving home from work and then you get home and you're like, how did I even get here? Mm. It's because you've done it so many times before and your brain is on autopilot. It's programmed into the subconscious. And so you're automatically hitting the blinker, making your turns, getting yourself safely to your driveway. It's the same principles and fundamentals that we teach in the special operations community that police, fire, everybody teaches in high stress occupation occupations. When it comes to individual personal safety, especially with mothers because they've got multiple kids that they're juggling and kids are crazy. Trust me. I, I got mm. one and I can really <laughs> handle them. He's two and he's just wigging out every day. The goal is that we begin to implement. And that's the purpose of this book back here is we begin to implement very small and easy attainable tasks with immense accountability. There's a lot of communication that goes back and forth group chatting. I'm reaching out to people all the time, constantly shooting texts, doing video calls, just bothering the hell out of everyone once I, whenever I can. But the goal is that we're, we're implementing very easy tasks to begin with that anybody could do. And what we're doing is we're building routine and habit. And then as we uh, identify the accomplishment of these tasks and habits, we begin to increase the frequency and the complexity of those skill sets. And so as we increase the complexity and the frequency of those skill sets, what we're doing is we're programming the information from the conscious into the subconscious mind. And so now you have the mother who has two or three kids while she's putting her groceries back in the car. And all of a sudden she realizes subconsciously that something doesn't feel right. And she turns around and she notices that there's you know, three men walking in the parking lot who don't appear like they deserve to be there or should be there. So what does she do? She looks at them in the face and eyes. She gets her pepper spray ready or whatever type of personal safety tool she has. Uh, maybe even a woman when she's just walking down the sidewalk, instead of taking the corner, like if she's turning the corner, instead of turning it so close to the building, she actually takes it a couple steps out. Why? Because subconsciously she's programmed herself to take those extra steps to keep herself a little bit safer. And so that is the end state. That is like the goal is to be able to program these skills and these belief systems into the person's subconscious, which it's scientifically proven that it can happen because most humans have a flight response. But when you look at the military and police and fire and all these people who train for these high stress situations, repetition is master. And then eventually they find themselves operating in a level of sub subconscious. You never rise to the occasion in high stress situations. You only fall back to the greatest level of training you've ever received. Mm, that's, in that's incredible. And uh no doubt you probably had similar training in the military as well. Like, you know, that repetition, it, it makes it, you know, subconscious. So, uh, you yeah. know, often we see people go through, you know, safety training and they do it once off and, and then they forget it when it comes to crunch time, you know. And so you panic at the time of, you know, when you're getting, getting confronted and then yep. you don't know what to do. But if it exactly. if you've got that programmed in you, then you can respond in a way that's calm calculated and you know exactly what you're doing and you won't panic that is that is yep. gold right there yeah you, i mean you try to believe that you're gonna i, I say wwmmd what would matthew mcconaughey do <laughs> you know, he'd, be, he'd be cool right yeah um but unfortunately you know we're still probably these erratic um you know bundles of mess however we're an erratic bundle of mess that's performing very well because we're focusing on the process mm. and not the possibility of the end state we're living in the moment and quite honestly that's one of the things i loved about combat as ironic as that sounds is that it forces you to live in that absolute moment there's nothing else that matters besides that mm. and so you're absolutely right you know when we program in the subconscious something a trigger initiates and then all of a sudden the brain goes boop down here to the subconscious. And there's been times where I've blacked out in my life because I was so scared. Mm. When all was said and done, I performed perfectly, as perfect as one can. So mm, that's incredible. And so, you know, if there's um, women, and I am saying women, if there's women listening to this, Joe, and they they have been through some kind of confrontation they've been a victim of some kind of crime or violence and they're scared what's some of the tips that you could give them off the bat right now that would help them yeah 
So keep in mind, this is very general, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is very, very general. And I understand that each individual is going through their own set of uh, circumstances. But I would say that if you can reach out and see, if you're going to seek help from somebody, you really need to make sure that it's somebody that's going to be a good teacher, a good instructor, a good mentor. Just because somebody was a cop for 35 years or a military person for whatever years does not mean that they are a good teacher, a good mentor, that they're empathetic at all. So you really, really got to be careful about who you're going to trust and opening your, that part of yourself up to. Uh, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is you need to develop that self-confidence and that self-belief system. So how do we do that? How do we overcome the trauma, the tethers of that trauma from the past? And it starts with identifying ways that we could develop belief in ourself. And how do we develop belief in ourself? Well, it's what I call the realignment process, the actual self from the true self. And so we need to realign our actual self back towards our true self, our max potential version of ourself. And it always begins with keeping the promises that we're making to ourselves. So for example, when I was coming out of my hellacious depressive period of life where I was ready to blow my brains out, the only reason I didn't is because I passed out drunk with the gun in my mouth. When I was coming out of that, I knew that there were certain periods of the day, nighttime specifically, when I was beginning to get triggered. So I needed to avoid that. What did I do? I went to bed very, very early. Well, I couldn't go to bed early. So for myself, I did take sleeping pills. I don't take them anymore. Uh, but I took some sleeping meds, went to bed early, and then I woke up super early. Waking up super early then allowed me to set another goal. Okay, well, I'm going to just drink a tall glass of water. So I'm going to bed early. I'm drinking a tall glass of water. Those are both positive momentum wins. Already, I'm beginning one the day before for the next day, and I'm beginning one early next day. It might seem, seem trivial, but it's not. It's developing a positive reinforcement within your momentum in your day. Next, I say, you know, I don't feel like going to the gym. Blood flow heals all things. So I just go to the gym, I sit there, and then I leave. I'm developing the habit. Then I start lifting a little weights. The point of me saying all this is that in order to develop self-confidence, you must be attaining and keeping and executing goals that your promises that you're making to yourself consistently over a period of time. Easiest and best way to do it is to strengthen yourself physically. Get to the gym, blood flow heals all things. Strengthen yourself, watch your diet, your nutrition, and watch your body physically change and your confidence will just grow immensely. And this is why I start with the mind, the body, and the spirit whenever we're going through these coaching programs is because when people can actually push themselves to inflict that self-adversity, to overcome that, to put themselves in the gym, to watch their diet, restricted caloric intake, and then they see their body begin to manifest and change in the physical realm, that right there is the number one thing I've ever seen produce the most insane amount of confidence in the shortest period of time for any human being, myself included, because myself got way out of shape when I was all depressed. I was just like looking crazy fugly. But after that, skills. So get some good training. In the States here, I always encourage women to go use firearms because firearms training will develop confidence because you can handle yourself against the worst, most egregious offense. So I know it's kind of long-winded. Just let me summarize here really quick. You know, one is to definitely, if you're going to seek mentorship, make sure it's somebody you could trust, listen to them talk, make sure that you can connect with them. Two is to develop a system of self promises that you can keep to yourself so you can build that positive momentum, stack those wins throughout your day. And then three, specifically with exercise, that's the best one. But then three is to develop the skill sets required in order to ensure that that never happens to you again, that you could overcome that adversity. Mm, such great tips. And I think, you know, that self-confidence piece and um, keeping those promises to yourself, it can be so easy to not do that when you're suffering as a victim of anything that you just want to not show up for yourself and not actually keep your own promises. That can be some of the easiest things to do. But that alone, I think, has such greater strength than any tactical kind of thing you could teach a woman, right? Oh, absolutely. The way that we talk to ourselves is everything. And that's why so many people are so depressed, so unsuccessful in their own terms in their life. That's why they're so wandering and confused and they don't know what their purpose in life is, is because of the way that they talk to themselves. And, and I'm speaking from experience. Mm. I hated myself. I absolutely, I hated myself. I wanted to hurt myself. I did hurt myself through my actions consistently, which unfortunately ended up hurting a lot of other people emotionally. But you know, it's, it's, I've made my amends in the past, but 
the best way, the only way really, what, what drove me was that I became emotionally involved in my own like recovery process. And we are all made up of energy on the most basic level. We are all energy in the form of matter. And so when we get emotional about something, emotion, energy in motion. So when we're emotional about something, that's when we can finally push ourselves past whatever tether is holding us down. And we can begin to take small minute action steps towards attaining our true self, the maximum version of our own life. Mm, and it's really just taking that first step, isn't it? And that's the hardest part sometimes, mm. you know, like just to pull your ass out of bed and be like, why am I doing this? I don't even care if I die, but there needs to be some sort of a trigger, you know, otherwise you just will die. And and that's what unfortunately happens when a lot of people kill themselves here in the States. There's over 8,000 veterans a year that kill themselves. That's more than Iraq and Afghanistan. Like it's, it's crazy. That's incredible. And it's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, and yeah. Oh, we're so glad you're here with us though, Joe. And if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about what you do, where can they go? Yeah. So, you know, th this has been great. I really appreciate, you know, coming on here. Instagram is my most active platform, Joseph underscore Malone underscore official. I put up safety tips and nutrition, fitness, everything we've talked about here today, I put up on there. But then for my more corporate professional clients and some personal training stuff, if you can go to southerncross.company and that website is uh, what hosts most of my corporate training, violence prevention, de-escalation platforms. And being in the Southern Hemisphere, you're familiar with the Southern Cross constellation yes. in the sky. Yeah. Up here in the North, everyone's like, what's the Southern Cross? Mm. Um you know, it's uh, it's meant to serve as a guide when you're in troubled waters and in troubled times. You look up, you see the constellation, and it can guide you to safety. That's what I want to be for people. I love that. That's such a such a good one, and I'm I'm glad that I can see that in my backyard. Thank you so much, Joe. Now I've got the last big question for you: What's the change you'd like to see in the world, and how can we bring it to life? I would like to see people develop the ability to become lethal the ability to become lethal because lethality means you're capable of implementing and employing that violence against whatever justifiably if it ever comes down to that however the most lethal people that i've ever known in my life have always been the most peaceful mm. the most understanding the most comfortable the most confident the most open and empathetic because they know that they can take care of themselves in the worst situation and they believe in themselves because they keep those promises to themselves. They have great self-confidence. If we could elevate everybody's levels of lethality and independence and self-reliance, I truly, truly believe that we could have more peace on this planet than we've ever had at any period of time in our existence. Because if we all have the ability to defend ourselves with great lethality, then we all are going to be capable of preserving great peace, not just within ourselves, but amongst ourselves. And, and a point underneath all that, Joe, is there's a certain level of discipline that's got to happen to be that lethal, right? And so, oh, yeah, discipline, yep, it's yeah. huge. And so even in that, um, to be peaceful, and I love what you've said there in that some of the most lethal people you know are some of the most peaceful. It's like that wolf that you feed, isn't it? It's like we've we've both got that light and that dark in us, but it's really finding that balance and also knowing where it's appropriate to apply it. Absolutely. The, the discipline that you mentioned is absolutely imperative to developing all of these systems that we've talked about here today. I talk about it all the time, discipline and persistence. When you, your feelings don't matter, mm. you must push forward and obtain the definite object that you're seeking to reach, the goal that you want to attain, the person you want to become. You know, great emotional control, great emotional resiliency, the discipline to control your actions. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people are lacking. And I think that's why we see a lot of this reckless violence is because people don't have discipline in those areas. Mm. Oh, that's a whole other podcast, I'm sure. Uh, Joe, I have loved every single second with you. Thank you so much for being a part of the Ethical Evolution. Uh, thank you very much, Mindy. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution podcast. If you're ready to be the change and would love to work with me on finding your voice through spiritual coaching or creating your own podcast with impact, visit ethicalchangeagency.com.
Introducing the Deep Leadership Podcast. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former submarine officer who spent 22 years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Deep Leadership is real-world, actionable leadership advice from John and his expert guests. Become a leader worth following. Subscribe today. Electric Acid. Electric Acid. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonize your mind, body, and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together we explore vibrations, frequencies and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Electric Acid. 